All right, well, it looks like we have our, our quorum. So let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and, or morning or evening or, or what, wherever it, whenever it might be, uh, wherever you are as you're, as you're tuning in. It's, it's great to see everyone and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. So my name is Andrew Bremer. I'm an Associate Program Officer on the Board on Life Sciences here at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, our, our session today. And, and for many of you, welcome back to our series of discussions of uh, workshop discussions uh, for our standing committee on biotechnology capabilities and national security needs. Um, today, our session is the uh, final plan discussion for our cutting edge scientific capabilities for biological detection workshop series, uh, following on from our discussions last week. Um, so on the next slide, then there's just a little bit more info for today, as well as a couple notes that I wanted to make before getting started. Uh, so similar to as I said before, just to, to take a, a, a moment to mention, as I did last week, this workshop is very similar to others at the National Academies in that the discussions do not result in any formal recommendations as an outcome of the discussion. Um, however, the public proceedings will be published in the next couple of months if you're interested in returning to the discussions from the workshop. Um, those public, uh, public proceedings will chronicle the presentations and discussions that take place uh, both last week and, and today as well. So just to note that the discussion is being recorded and participation may be included in those proceedings. Um, if you would prefer not to have your particip uh, participation included, we just encourage you to only watch and listen in into the discussion. However, if you are interested, we very much encourage use of the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, if you don't have the Q&A function popped up, you'll be able to click on the three dots in the lower right hand uh, screen of the uh, WebEx portal and you'll see the Q&A function, function there. Um, with that though, for today, I first want to welcome and introduce the uh, chair of our standing committee, Dr. Todd Coleman, for some brief remarks. Dr. Coleman is an associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering at Stanford University. His multidisciplinary research expertise spans applied probability, bioelectronics, physiology, synthetic biology, and more. And it's been uh, such a delight working with him in these last uh, couple of months as we started up the standing committee. He holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering and computer engineering from the University of Michigan and his master's and PhD in electrical engineering from MIT. Uh, Dr. Coleman, Todd, welcome, uh, and I'll, I'll pass things over to you. Uh, uh, good morning slash afternoon to everyone. And so, uh, yeah, and I'd first like to just uh, welcome everyone to this exciting workshop session today. I'm personally very enthusiastic. Uh, this doesn't feel like work because it's, you know, to be honest, this is fun turning science fiction into reality. And so uh, uh, the, the standing committee that Andrew mentioned, the Standing Committee on uh, Biotechnology Capabilities and National Security Needs uh, was established to facilitate active uh, cross-sector engagement among stakeholders as uh, we explore new and emerging biotechnologies uh, with the potential to enable national security relevant uh, capabilities. And so we had a, uh, some workshop sessions last week, four of them actually, and they were planned uh, with that goal in mind. Um, and we hope that uh, this active engagement fostered by these sessions uh, continues as our standing committee uh, continues to explore and develop uh, future events such as this, uh, where we try to examine uh, additional biotechnologies and implications for their research uh, development and deployment. And so, in short, I would just like to say, uh, please not hesitate to reach out and get in touch with uh, our committee uh, or staff. <clears throat> so with that, I hand it back to Andrew. Thanks so much, Todd. Um, and, and we'll dive right into it. And so I wanna introduce now to you, our vice chair for the standing committee and the moderator for our session today, Dr. Diane Deulis. Dr. Deulis is a senior research fellow at National Defense University. Her research areas include emerging biological technologies, biodefense and preparedness for bio threats with specific areas of expertise, including dual use life sciences research, synthetic biology, the US bioeconomy and more. Prior to NDU, her, uh, she held roles at the NIH as well as uh, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, serving as the Assistant Director for Life Sciences. Um, she holds a PhD in biology from the University of Delaware. Uh, Diane, uh, Dr. Delis, welcome, and I'll turn things over to you. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Andrew, and thanks to Todd for um, both of you kicking this off. I'm really excited about this session, and um, 
This is, uh, as Todd mentioned, this is sort of a follow on from last week's really interesting um, sessions that we had on, um, on uh, capabilities overall related to biological detection. So today we're gonna to discuss the impending impact of scaled and accessible brain sensing technologies. And um, one of the things that struck me from last week's sessions was uh, number one, how rapidly many of these technologies are advancing. Um, and, and Todd alluded to this as well. And I think in the brain sciences, um, many of us who are used to things kind of edging forward on a very slow scale of development when it comes to the human brain are seeing sort of leaps and bounds being made in this, in this space. Um, so as was discussed last week, we've been seeing this dramatic rise in our ability to detect, capture, and make sense of vast amount of data originating from the brain and its physiology. Uh, one of my um, research collaborators, Dr. Jim Giordano from um, Georgetown University, we have called this and referred to this as neurodata, kind of distinguishing it from other types of um, biological data because when it has to do with the brain, it always has to do with behavior and um, how uh, and 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 human beings, uh, right? When we're talking about the human brain, so today we're going to hear about advancements in neurodetection, neurodetection technologies, their implications, and and really continue this discussion. So it's um, my pleasure to be um, in. Uh, welcoming our guest speakers, which include Jonathan Barrent and Dr. Alan Levy. So first, um, Jonathan, who I believe goes by J.B. Barrent, is the CEO and founder of Next Sense, which is spinoff of X, Google's moonshot factory. Um, while he was at X, he built a team to develop brain sensing technologies and grew this project into an early funded pipeline project just as recently as 2020. So working with prominent sleep and dream researchers, he published a groundbreaking study revealing a mechanism to study altered states of consciousness during sleep. He has a BA in philosophy and religious studies from Stanford. Dr. Alan Levy is the Goizeta Foundation Endowed Chair for Alzheimer's Disease Research. Kavita, I actually pronounced it. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, uh, and I apologies if I have not. Um, at Emory, um, and he, uh, where he is the founding director of that institute at Brain Health for Personalized Medicine. He's a neurologist and neuroscientist working on mechanisms and biomarkers for neurodegenerative disease, an area that I spent a lot of time in when I was, while I was at the NIH. So I'm very excited to hear um, these updates. Um, Dr. Levy is an internationally recognized leader in this space and a member of the National Academy of Medicine's uh, graduating BS from the University of Michigan and an MD and PhD in immunology from the University of Chicago. So JB and Alan, thank you so much. Um, we're excited to hear what you have to say and I'm gonna turn it over to you for your direct remarks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Diane and, and Todd. Andrew and Kavita for uh, inviting us, and, and we hope we'll have a really good discussion today. Alan and I like this title, Look Up. Uh, it comes from, I was uh, dealing with one of Alan's colleagues, uh, Dr. David Rye, and uh, we were having a discussion. He said, uh, JB, I guess you're the crowd that looks up, and, and I didn't you know, know if that was a good thing or not, so I had to watch the movie that maybe many of you have watched, uh, which is entitled Don't Look Up, uh, but if you haven't seen it, you, you want to look up. You want to be part of that crowd. So. Um, we thought that was a, a fitting uh, title because we are going to be talking about something that is exciting. There, there's a lot that uh, can happen with ubiquitous brain technology, but there's some things that we need to think about. And I think one of the things that we um, <clears throat> haven't seen enough in uh, in terms of Silicon Valley tech uh, leadership is thoughtful uh, introduction of new tech. And so we, we hope to have a more of a balanced view uh, of this, this exciting area. So. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alan to give us a bit of a primer of, you know, so we can understand this uh, novel way um, of sensing brain waves. but we're going to start with more of a primer on EEG um, uh, that will hopefully set the stage. So, Alan, I'll go ahead and advance the slides for you. Great. Thanks, JB, and thanks, everybody, for the uh, introduction. And so, I feel like a little, uh, like a little bit of, out of water here. Um, so, my expertise in neurology and neuroscience is not EEG. So, I'm a perfect person to give you a primer. Uh, this is a, a diverse group, and uh, let me try and just walk you back my perspective on EEG as a neurologist. And you know, so this has been a technology that's been around a long time. Electroencephalography was 
um, discovered in 1924, Hans Berger um, in Germany did this and, you know, recorded, you know, one little electro putting it on the scalp and his family and friends and himself was able to detect that there was electrical activity in the brain. You know, and it was about 10 years later that um, people started really replicating it. But what you're looking at is his first publication was five years later. So it's been around almost 100 years now. And you can see that one trace in the opposite upper is the brain activity, uh, the EEG. And what, you know, this has been now commonplace in neurology really since the 1930s, 1940s, and psychiatry, really. Berger is a psychiatrist. And the fields of neurology and psychiatry were very much more unified than they are today. Um, and people were using EEG and exploring it for all sorts of things. Uh, JB and I were joking earlier, Hans Berger, actually, I think the motivation for him to do this was his interest in mental telepathy, uh, that maybe brain waves could be transmitted, you know, thoroughly uh, and to communicate um, non-verbally in remote distances. So maybe that's where we'll go to later in the discussion. Um, <laughs> we use EEG routinely in medicine for much more mundane purposes. So we use it, you know, commonly for detecting seizures. Very importantly, it's used to detect the states of consciousness. So it's not uncommon if somebody's confused, they'll get an EEG for the neurologist to determine if there's a metabolic change and their brain cells are just not firing well, or whether they might be having subclinical seizures. And even a person in coma, we often don't sometimes used to use this instead of a brain death you know, to determine if somebody was brain dead or not. And EEG, the brain activity is also the basis for how we monitor sleep in uh, sleep medicine. And over the last couple decades, there's been much more robust use of EEG for also event related potentials, which um, we will also talk a little bit more about. JB will give you some examples. And so down in the lower right there, you see a, a cartoon of, you know, what an EEG really looks like, the way it's used in medicine and for the most part in research. Um, there's an array of electrodes that are pasted onto the scalp of a patient. Uh, some companies now have caps that you can put higher density um, caps on, but you're measuring electrical activity across the surface of the brain. And on the lower left panel, um, you can see it. What what the electrical activity is really the manifestation of the way brain cells communicate. And you can imagine there's electrical activity that you could measure in different parts of the brain that reflect the different brain structures, which are involved in different brain activities. And it's long been known that there are different rhythms of the uh, electrical, um, you know, the dipoles that are getting measured on the scalp surface. In fact, Hans Berger himself um, was given then the, the alpha rhythm, as it's called, which is the frequency of waves on that third tracing down in the lower left. Um, that's the alpha rhythm. The frequency of those rhythms is about 8 to 10 hertz um, per second. So um, it used to be called the Berger rhythm. Um, and in fact, for many years, the EEG filtered out high frequency things. But these different frequencies of which these waves of electricity are, are propagated reflect different brain states. The very bottom is what we don't want to do. If anybody now is in delta rhythm, that means you're sleeping or comatose, not good. Um, and up at these higher frequencies, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the most important cognition um, and intellectual processing is occurring at these high frequencies that weren't appreciated until recently. And so um, there's a lot of information you can gain out of just measuring the surface of the scalp. Um, but there's some real problems and it hasn't really been widely used. You know, I'm not sure what the committee has talked about earlier, but I think about the ways we assess brain function are often very static. Imaging, uh, brain imaging, uh, MRI, even functional MRI. And so EEG is like mi millisecond, microsecond time scales that are how the brain is really communicating in real time. If you go to the next slide, JB. Um, so there, until recently, there have been a lot of challenges that um, have really limited the use and I think creative thinking about how the EEG might be tapped uh, for innovative purposes, medical and research and otherwise. And typically the way it's used, you can see some pictures of people with uh, EEGs. That's, that's our friend JB up there in the upper left. Um, he shaved his hair to make sure there was good connectivity of that EEG. And down on the, the bottom is a typical setup for a sleep study, which happens in cl clinical labs all the time. So you can see these electrodes are pasted on. It's not easy. It's a pain, a pain to get these set up. 
And typically what's done is you just capture a small snapshot of brain activity across those regions that are getting monitored. You know, typically 20 minutes or so in a clinical evaluation. With the sleep study, it's overnight. Um, and one of the, some of the really important limitations, though, are what's getting monitored is actually just the very top surface of the brain uh, around the top edges. So most of the some of the most elegant areas of the brain that are responsible for our highest behavioral functions are not tapped into with that EEG. Um, and then most importantly, I think one of the things I've got very interested in is we, we're in this whole new era of digital biomarkers, how we can phenotype people and individuals as we go towards personalized medicine. And digital biomarkers are uh, held with great promise. Um, in part because we can collect, we can think about collecting information in real time over long time periods and at scale, which is what um, the technology JB is going to talk about in a minute. It really opens up. And on the next slide, um, uh, JB, as you heard, has founded this company, NextSense, which got spun out of X. The, the lower left there, on the left side, you see an MRI picture of the brain. And there's a little red um, you know, dot under the temporal lobe is where the EEG sits in these earbuds that uh, JB and his team have developed. So these are earbuds that are placed in the middle ear canal, and you can see it sits right under the temporal lobe. That temporal lobe is one of the most difficult areas for us to access um, electrically or otherwise when it comes to brain function for clinical or research purposes. Yet that temporal lobe structure is where the hippocampus is. That's the site of the brain that is responsible for forming memories. It's essential for forming new memories. Um, it's also the part of the brain that's deeply involved in, in language and in personality. Um, and, it's, it's, and it's the area of the brain that most often causes seizures. So it's, it's the most epileptogenic part of the brain. These earbuds can sit in people. And what we did together with JB and his team is first proof of concept are we able to measure brain activity? And we brought this into our epilepsy monitoring unit at Emory, monitored 20 patients. You're looking at the uh, you know, electroencephalogram. The very top channel there is, uh, is labeled ear. There are two earbuds, one on the left and one on the right. You can see the cursor. That's the signal, the electrical signal, which is identical to the signal below it, which is the surface EEG. In fact, these are uh, these were done in people with intracranial electrodes, so it's it's pretty um, horrific if you're not aware. But we stick dozens of electrodes deep into the brain in individuals with epilepsy to determine which part of the ba brain is irritable. So this was the absolute ground truth. We could compare the intracranial recordings with the ear EEG and determine that um, this is very high fidelity that we were able to recapitulate the signal predominantly in the temporal lobe, which is where we would expect. And we also, uh, as JB mentioned, my colleague, Dr. David Rise, a sleep expert at Emory, um, it's already clear that you can use these earbuds to monitor sleep in a way that really is unprecedented. And so I've become convinced in this process that this is a, a, a terrific opportunity for us to monitor brainwave activity, at least from the temporal lobe region and the surround, including the adjacent frontal lobe, and do it chronically um, at scale. And so I'm going to turn it over to JB now, who's really the expert. Oh, thanks so much, uh, Alan. And, you know, it, to, to start off, there's been a lot of researchers doing some fantastic research in here. And, and hopefully I have a few slides I can give credit to some of the, the pioneers in the research. But we did build this early prot prototype. It looks like this. Um, I am recording brainwaves right now. Uh, who knows what we'll, we'll mine from this conversation, Alan. Hopefully I was paying attention to what uh, you were just saying, but, but maybe you can hold me accountable. We'll, we'll look at it together afterwards. But it is a, it's a prototype. It records about 50 hours. It can do it both on device as well as across a, a Bluetooth connection, much like your AirPods might go to the phone. We have that uh, transmitting you know, to a phone and it you know, records, which then goes up into the cloud. We designed these custom, so as you can see, um, they fit really nicely into my ear, and they have a very basic, um, you know, design without any electronics inside, just passive recording uh, with the conductive material that allows for the biopotential acquisition, and then it travels to the device itself. One of the challenges, I mean, Hans Berger himself had a couple decades um, before his research was taken seriously and replicated. So we wondered, how are we going to convince people that this is a, 
a valid location. And so even before we did the clinical work that Alan's talking about at X, we had to come up with some way of validating it. So I'll just briefly take you through that. We created this ballistic gel phantom with these dipoles that would be generating signal, and then we could put the earbuds into this um, non-human model to make sure that we were picking up signals uh, from a known uh, generated signal source. And so we passed that. Then uh, you heard about the burger rhythm or the alpha rhythm. So it was a good day when we were able to close our eyes and be able to see that alpha rhythm, which generates from the occipital region. So it wasn't obvious that we'd be able to detect that, you know, in ear, but we can see that, and that was. Um, again, a boost in our confidence. Um, we did do the, the ECOG uh, correlation, and so Alan mentioned that. Um, you know, this is kind of an eye chart, but essentially what you can do is you can look at various correlations by frequency. So, you know, do you see correlation in the beta frequency from the ground truth to the ear? Do you see it in the theta? Do you see it, you know, in the alpha and even in the gamma? And so we looked at that both sleeping and waking across the patient population at Emory, and we found some really interesting things. Um, and what was, uh, I think, most interesting is that the correlations weren't spurious. How do we know that they weren't spurious? Well, you can see on this graph, high correlation is in the yellow and darker yellow, and you know, no correlation is sort of this light blue. You do get some inverse correlation depending on dipole orientation. But you know, when you look at the places that we had the highest correlation, it made anatomical sense. You know, so we, it was right there in that temporal region. So this gave us, you know, again, more confidence that what we're seeing is, is not just random noise and we're making false conclusions. So we saw this at the theta rhythm. We saw this at the alpha rhythm. And we saw this surprisingly at gamma. I, I don't think we have enough data to be uh, comfortable confirming that we see um, this reliably. But there is some way that it makes sense. That picture that Alan showed you, there is less um, bone material that's separating from the source acquisition and uh, the neural correlate. And that's thicker as you get into the skull. So, you know, people are skeptical of gamma on the surface area. However, perhaps as we get closer inside with less attenuation of the signal, we are picking up gamma. And, you know, at some point, Alan, people might be interested in the 40 hertz work uh, that's happening right now in Alzheimer's. And we can talk about that if that's of interest, uh, Diane. So that's pretty exciting. And then, of course, as Alan mentioned, you know, we did pick up seizures. And these are some of the original slides that we used. And it was during sleep. You know, that was something that was new for me, uh, learning that people have these subclinical seizures that they don't even know they have and many, um, many times uh, at night. And so it's nice that we'd be able to detect that. And we talked a little bit about the sleep staging. We, you know, we're picking up all the characteristic waveforms, um, which pretty much look the same as they do on scalp. There's not that much difference in terms of the morphology of the waves. And here's where I just wanted to give a little bit of credit. So uh, Kid Mose in our house, one of the first uh, pioneers about a decade ago, uh, Daniela Mandich of Imperial College of London and Tamvu University of Colorado. I've, I've spent time with all of them. I've read their publications. And if you're really interested about your EEG, um, I highly recommend you check uh, check out anything that's um, uh, published by these uh, these folks. Now we did some interesting experiments, and um, uh, Dr. Ken Paller and Phyllis Z uh, were the researchers on this, and we looked at to see if we could enhance slow wave sleep. And it's really interesting that if you phase lock on the slow wave uh, pattern itself and put an auditory stimulus. Um, when we did a, a double blind controlled crossover study, we did see some impact on slow wave activity. And so Alan uh, and I've been talking about this for several years that perhaps there's something we can do to intervene uh, because there is a known uh, correlation between sleep fragmentation of slow wave sleep and cognitive decline. And perhaps uh, there's a way to have some intervening activity. And so we looked at that. Um, it was interesting that there were responders and non-responders. We don't really understand why. Some people responded uh, very favorably. Uh, when you did break it into that you know, category, you know, we did see some people doing better on memory tests. So um, uh, Dr. Powler designed declarative memory tests, and, and we looked at that across the uh, uh, various uh, cohorts. And those that had more slow wave activity uh, did better on uh, the memory test. So that's, that's interesting research. Um, we also did some novel uh, work around attention decoding. Uh, the reference I made about I'm recording my brain waves. 
Um, you can, if you match the auditory track with the brain waves, you will see some similarities if the person is paying attention. So uh, at X, we were wondering if this could be a novel way to control interfaces. Um, but then as I got to know Alan and I got more interested in the medical domain, I thought, you know, maybe strength of attention to become a biomarker for brain health. And so uh, Malcolm Slaney at, at Google, he's one of the uh, top researchers in, in the world around this space of auditory attention. And we actually did this where we had this very difficult task with, uh, you can see electrodes around the ear, two different audio books played at the same volume. People had to look straight ahead and attend left versus right, one minute left, one minute right. And um, with the exception of, of subject number two, we were able to really tell uh, which one they were attending to. So that's, that's quite interesting and, and might be some interesting implications of that. Um, and then lastly, <clears throat> a little bit, uh, maybe this is almost a little creepy, um, to be honest, we did uh, we did a, a session to see if the ERP could be um, indicative of whether you like something or dislike something. So you know, with Android phones, they do a photo burst, and so we showed uh, a range of photos. We had people subjectively like or dislike um, the various photos, and indeed, we saw um, some correlation between uh, a dislike. And so, when the brain sees something that it doesn't like, there is just this um, you know involuntary response. And there are studies of that that are you know, kind of putting into question free will itself, like what happens, you know, first, the, the response or the conscious experience of it. Uh, but we did find some uh, interesting uh, research there. Um, and then we did some very interesting research. Uh, again, this, the credit goes to uh, Karen Conkley and, and Ken Powler, uh, who pioneered this research. I just happened to be subject zero. Um, and, and that was where uh, leveraging the work of targeted memory reactivation, where you pair a tone during conscious activity and you play that tone at the right phase of sleep, it can trigger a memory. And so that can be either a way to enhance memories if you're learning a new language, or in our case, we wanted to induce a special uh, hybrid state of consciousness where you actually are still asleep, but you can do things like math problems. And so that was published in Cell Biology. And um, I think Ken may be in attendance uh, uh, on, the, on the call. And, and he even told me that it made the late night show. Um, so his research uh, is, is quite interesting. And, and I was uh, very happy to be able to participate in, in some way. And I think that's it. Diane, we'll uh, pass it over to you for questions. Okay, wow. Um, there's a lot going through my mind right now. That was really um, a fascinating presentation. So sort of one of one of the first things I want to mention is that um, in, in I, I was involved in a, in a recent um, set of DoD workshops where we've been looking at some of these different neurotechnologies and brain machine interfaces. And, and one of the ways that we've talked about describing that space is about these technologies for assessment versus these technologies for real interventions um and then how how do we use data as like a force multiplier to kind of expand in in both of those categories mm -hmm. and um so i i <laughs> i was watching your during your comments i'm like wow you you've hit on all of these three <laughs> with one um product here in these earbuds you can use these earbuds for assessments as you're examining people's brain waves when they sleep or doing other other kinds of activities but then you could advance these to an actual intervention where you're creating a sound that then um, creates an intervention in the patient. So, um, and then you can use these sort of reams of data to make observations about how people, um, you know, behave in looking at images and things like that. So what's fascinating to me, again, is the same kind of experiences we were having at last week's sessions is, how rapidly this technology is traversing all three of those categories at once. So I guess, um, so that's that's just a comment um, that other people may have, have questions and I'm gonna um, try and look for people's hands up. But in the meantime, so, so let, let's talk about the earbuds and, and their sort of general use. So right now you're using them for this exploratory research. Do you see them as products? What, what, what kind of applications do you see the, the this as a product, what kind of applications do you see in real time use going forward? Sure. No, great, great question, Diane. So we are uh, pursuing an FDA clearance of the device uh, so that we be able to use this primarily uh, that we have the data that we have uh, supports 
uh, patients with epilepsy being one of our, our first primary targets because the signal is very big. Uh, sometimes it is focal, so not all seizures manifest in any kind of tonic-clonic, you know, motor activity. And so being able to capture accurate seizure burden could, one, speed diagnosis for some. Uh, some people are on this very long, multi-month, even multi-year odyssey to really determine uh, what they're having. But then others uh, for medicine titration, you know, so uh, another great colleague of, of Alan's is Dan Winkle at uh, Emory. And, and he said, you know, JB, I'm a scientist, you know, and I, I want to make decisions based on data. But right now, when I see patients, I have to base it on a diary. And I know that, you know, it's been shown that these diaries are not accurate. So, you know, imagine, you know, the conflict I feel in, in lowering a medicine dose, even though I know the side effects are tremendous for AEDs, I, you know, I can't in, in, uh, in good conscience lower it because I don't know if their seizure diary is accurate. Compare that with an accurate seizure burden. You know, then you could imagine the doctors being able to more holistically treat the quality of life and you know, minimize those side effects by keeping people seizure free. So we see that as kind of our immediate use case and um, mm -hmm. hope to bring that to the world. Too. I would say, JB, I would just add that uh, the second obvious one to us for medical applications is really going to be sleep. Mm -hmm. Right. So people probably know that, you know, it, overnight sleep centers are rapidly vanishing because insurers will pay for only in home sleep studies. And we really don't have good ways to assess sleep, um, you know, to be honest mm -hmm. with you medically. And so th this would could be a real game changer for us because you could also imagine a microphone. We could hear snoring. Uh, didn't get into it. You can pick up eye movements by that. Mm -hmm. You know, so you really can stay. That's enables the staging of sleep. So I think stage, sleep disorders underlie so much uh, morbidity um, mm -hmm. themselves, but the risk for other diseases, cardiac disease and the like. So. I think there's a, a big market for that. Certainly a big move. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, one of the hurdles and barriers that we're getting over in this space with neurodetection in general is the non-invasiveness, the fact that you can use these non-invasive methods of assessing the brain and then you know making these observations and then interventions on top of them so it's it's just amazing okay so i i see um charles has his hand up so let's go there first i want to um, remind everyone to go ahead and put questions comments into the chat and uh andrew and i will do our best to to field those um so charles go ahead yeah so i was wondering about how well localized the signal is you you mentioned that there's a strong correlation when you do ECOG correlation with the ear earbuds, but what if the the uh, epileptic focus is far from the temporal lobe? How uh, effective is that technology at, at detecting remote sites? And you know, because people have are often sent home with a whole scalp full of uh, electrodes to do a longitudinal monitoring. So the question is, what the relative uh, effectiveness of those two technologies would be? Yeah, no, great, great question, Charles. And that's that's part of the primary area of research right now. So because we have the stereotactic electrodes, the depth electrodes, and we have the MRI, we've been able to do reconstruction um, of those and, and basically see, you know, the gradient of how far we can go into the brain. Um, obviously, the uh, uh, lateral temporal lobe, we have good coverage, you know, as you get in, you know, more mesial temporal lobe, hippocampus, it's, you know, we have missed some seizures, you know, in that area. So I think we, we wouldn't, you know, ever claim that we're going to have full coverage, you know, for the ear. Um, in fact, you know, some of our analysis, if we look at different seizure types and, you know, how many generalized, we think about 85% is probably what we'll capture. Although you, you'll find, and, um, you know, Alan can confirm that from uh, his, uh, perspective as a neurologist, a lot of the, the seizures, especially the focal seizures, are temporal lobe. Um, so even if we can just, you know, capture those very well, and there's some, uh, there's a, a high prevalence that's undiagnosed in the Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment population, sometimes as high as 30% of those folks are actually having these subclinical seizures, you know, in that temporal lobe. So we feel like, you know, that would also be um, a good way for us to capture. So more more on that, uh, we'll certainly be publishing on you know our effects of of this reconstruction. Uh, to find I'll the just add to that, um, JB, that I was very surprised actually to see that there was some focal activity in the frontal lobe that also got picked up on occasion. You know, but certainly most seizures spread, and that's when it becomes a of a concern when it leaves one part of the brain and spreads. And so once it spreads, then it's pretty easy to detect. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I want to go over to Rocco Casagrande, who had his hand up. He also put this question into the chat. Um, Rocco, um, are you, can you unmute? Sure. Do you just want me to read my question out? Sure. Go ahead. Just in case people on the phone can't see the chat. Sure. This is a fascinating talk. Thank you. I, I was wondering, I noticed the experiments where you provided a stimulus to the subjects were done on sleeping patients. I was wondering if what do you think the feasibility is of providing a stimulus to a subject who's awake to influence their opinions? Like, so you mentioned the liking or disliking a photo. Do you think it'd be feasible to add a stimulus to make someone like a photo more? And if so, what's the time frame that that kind of research might be in hand? And, and so by your question, like actually influence the subject experience of liking or just the neural correlate of liking that they report liking it let's just make it a simpler simpler readout versus whether they truly like it or not mm. I don't know Alan what what would you think about the feasibility of, of something uh, where you could stimulate uh, a particular center for like dislike yeah, it's that's a great question. I think it gets more into um, Diane's, um, you know, suggestion where where you're intervening, right? So there's got to be a way to modulate. Um, w one of the things we haven't talked about this, JB, but my mind went to some experiments that were done at NIH with a collaborator there, Kareem Zaglua, who also has intracranial electrodes, and um, you know, we've been also using digital technologies to monitor memory. And Kareem was putting electrodes really at deep depth throughout the uh, temporal lobe. And the waveforms, you can predict, basically use machine learning to predict whether someone's going to remember what they see or not. So we developed this eye tracking task, right? And so we can um, so we can predict with pretty good accuracy just by the brainwave activity. So that led us to start thinking, well, if you could do that, you could potentially intervene and block a memory or perhaps enhance a memory, which mm -hmm. is sort of the first step in whether you might like or dislike something. Because to dislike something, you probably have to have some experience with it previously. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that you know the um, some of these things that bring some cause for concern. I would say we probably don't have to be too concerned. You know, one thing that we haven't really talked about is EEG is a very noisy you know signal, and so some of the uh, neuroscience companies that are out there will will promise a lot in terms of you know the BCI. But part of you know based on my research on that, it, we're still pretty far away. So I think some of these scenarios. Um, we don't have to be concerned about in the short term. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I want to go over to Jorge now, Santiago Ortiz, who has his hand up with a question. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for this presentation. It's very exciting to see this technology. Um, have you thought about the applications of this technology to education in terms of assessing learning and um, better understanding the efficacy of different teaching techniques and learning environments? with the goal of improving educational experiences? Yes, yeah, great question, Jorge. I, I do think that there's some, some applications of that. And no doubt, you'll probably see some companies that leverage you know, ear or around the ear uh, technology to do just that. So uh, you think about the ADHD population and, and kids' attentions wondering, it is possible to decode both auditory attention and even visual attention. And so you could imagine some sort of haptic feedback, you know, maybe a little buzz on a, on a, on a wrist uh, when somebody's attention's wandering, you know, to help them uh, focus. You, you could imagine, you know, I don't know if this would necessarily um, be something that I recommend, but you could imagine where a teacher might have access uh, to this information and, and have a sense of, you know, who's paying attention um, and, you know, perhaps uh, a little bit of real time dialing in content to be assured that you're grabbing it. So I do think attention decoding itself is probably the area where you could get the most um, uh, kind of profitable uh, venture into the uh, education space. I think you could potentially even extend it. I totally agree with you, JB, about attention. And then the next step would be, if you attend to it, are you encoding it? Right. Mm. So, and I think because we're in that temporal lobe and the memory circuitry of the brain, you may be able to predict in the future whether somebody's actually going to re remember or learn what they're reading. So, that would, what a great application if uh, you, you know if the student knew they had to reread a paragraph. Um. So, so I I want to just uh, 
tease out one thing that I just heard um, JB say about how there's a certain amount of messiness in these EEGs. Can you identify particular individuals on the basis of their EEGs? And could you say more about that? Mm. Yeah, that, uh, we had a discussion about this, I think, uh, a week ago. And, and so there are some researchers. Um, in fact, uh, one woman, uh, I don't know if you've, if you've talked to her as part of one of your panels, but Sarah Laszlo uh, did some interesting uh, research in that area. And I think it's, it's possible. Uh, obviously, there is some initial evidence that it's there. I, I think one thing that's interesting about ear EEG is that Ear morphology is very unique. We, we um, had 5,000 ear scans and we did a principal component analysis and it's so unique. It's like a fingerprint. So you can imagine uh, certainly uh, devices going into an ear almost like a lock and a key. And then, you know, the signal that comes up is, you know, most likely very unique because it's where the uh, electrodes are always placed based on, you know, uh, the location. So I think in some ways ear EEG might make that even more likely to be successful as opposed to scalp because you know uh, as you may know you, you have to measure um, you know so you start at this location and it's you know called a 10 20 montage based on 10 percent and 20 percent distances and it's hard to get that exact versus the ear you know every time i put these in they're always in the same place they're always recording from the same location of brain and the erps is an interesting way so you might imagine a tone that's played there's going to be some sort of involuntary response and being able to capture that over time you know, one of the nice things about ERPs, and if you do them enough, you can average out the noise. And so, you know, imagine that you have just sort of this, you know, kind of sub uh, sub audible ping that's happening, you know, on some sort of basis throughout the day. It's really capturing what is what is JB's ERP to this sound? You know, what is Alan's ERP to this sound? And so then I think you could imagine, you know, with a, with a high amount of feasibility, you, you could get that sort of brain authentication. Alan, any additional thoughts on that? I guess, you know, that the related question is not just identification of particular individuals, but I guess um, certain uh, patterns or themes that appear that uh, say, okay, this person is pre-AD or early cognitive impairment or some other kind of condition. Is that sort of, is that a, is that a feasible thing? That's a great question. Yeah, I was thinking, um, probably especially with stimuli, right? So I think at resting state, I have a hard time imagining how we could pick up personal identifiers, except as JB mentioned through the anatomy. Um, but you certainly, we're all responding differently to our environment, right? And that's, boy, what a, how individualized can you get your environment and how your brain processes it? So you definitely could think about that. Um, we're very interested in exploring um, the role of the bio EEG in the ear for Alzheimer's disease as a biomarker and mild cognitive impairment. One of the things that JB and I are dreaming about is, you know, getting this into large numbers of healthy elderly individuals so we can understand in the long 20 year preclinical, you know, program of Alzheimer's disease. The pathology first starts in the brain in the temporal lobe, you know, as many of you may know, and it's exactly where we're picking up. So this could potentially be a very sensitive biomarker. Diana, I did see Sorry, I had it. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I saw I saw an interesting question in the in the chat pop up about the risks. I was just I was just putting that and it's directed to you. I'll read it just in case there's people on the phone. Do you envision a commercial version or future products where HIPAA may not apply and your philosophy on data privacy and security? And then tied to this, uh, uh, Michael also asked, what's the risk of misuse of this technology? And I believe Kavita also asked a, a similar question. Okay, so back right back over to you, JB. Yeah, no, I think, uh, as I, I mentioned at the very beginning, I think this is an area where we need to be really responsible and we need to be really thoughtful. And so I think the chief concern is around uh, data ownership and privacy. And so I, I one of the studies I think that um, is kind of jarring that was actually published in the Journal of National Academies was in 2014 when Kaczynski and Stillwell showed with just Facebook likes, not very many, uh, the ability for uh, AI to predict personality better. So, you know, with 70 uh, likes, the AI can predict your personality better than a coworker. With 150, it's a family member. And with 300 likes, uh, AI can uh, predict personality um, better than even your spouse. And so imagine now with the brain waves and the, the, you know, what you are actually responding to and liking like that, that just cannot go into the hands of big tech. You know, that's, um, that's just, that, that is just not 
um, what we want to see. And, and I think I feel very strongly about making sure that we take advantage of really the trend that's happening, which is, you know, the web three trend. So, you know, if, if uh, I'm not sure how much people are familiar with this, what's happening with web three, but, you know, web one was all about publishing. Uh, web two was all about user generated content, you know, such as you know, social media and things like that. But web three is taking advantage of uh, the blockchain technology. So those that are creating value, they own it and they get uh, they get the value. So you don't need uh, the middle companies, you know, the, in many ways, uh, the big tech companies to take that that profit. So I think that um, finding a way for people, you know, when they're using our earbuds, certainly that they're going to own that data. And if they choose to monetize it, if they want to um, uh, participate in pharmaceutical trials, they can certainly, you know, uh, do that and get compensated to it. You know, they should be able to donate if they want to to science. I mean, we're going to develop a, a version that is, you know, going to look something like this, where you could do a call. I'm doing this call, but it's not audio. The audio is coming through the speakers, but you can imagine doing audio through a pair of earbuds as well as the sensing and capturing those brain waves. And they should be able to donate that to science. Um, uh, and 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 you know, that's that's part of our vision. Um, so I think I think that's this is here before we know it. it you know, again, I'm uh, using the, the the product today. We have lots of people in the clinic using it. It'll be update clear. There are other companies, um, great entrepreneurs in the space that are, are doing also really amazing things. And so it's coming. And so I think we have to be really thoughtful and make sure that we have safeguards around the data and that the users are in control um, of what they do with it. Those are really good points. And I, I have a question from Kavita here that I want to make sure to get to. But before I do that, just, just following along the um, sort of how, how do we do some good due diligence around that space are there sort of how is the the data how do you envision data being protected i mean there are these like bluetooth devices involved in passing data to where they get stored and analyzed um and uh are they sort of unique programs i i have this in i have a vision in my mind of the future where There'll be DIY people out there getting unique earbuds created so they can measure their EEGs and then, you know, um, using programs to measure their own EEGs. We saw this with transcranial electric stimulation. Remember where people were like going on eBay and buying stuff they could use to stimulate their own brains and, and, and earbuds. How much how much more would they think that was cool? Right. So um, right. could you say what you think about that space just briefly? Sure. So I think I think a couple of things. One, we will go back to the fact that EEG is very noisy. So it, it's not like you know if if somebody were to take this recording that I had today, and you know would they be able to make anything you know meaningful out of it? It's it's just you know it's not that type of resolution. Um, I think that it's EEG combined with other data, right? It's it's you know EEG in response to a stimuli um, that you might be able to start making those pattern matches. So so that's one you know contextual thing to keep in mind. I do think that uh, some of the research that's going on with homomorphic encryption and you know, zero knowledge proofs uh, allow us to keep data local, right? You know, one of the things that Google, I think, was one of the first pioneers was this federated learning model. So, you know, as much as possible, keep keep the data local, such as the EEG to the device, and then only put, you know, update the model in the cloud. So, you know, we kind of imagine a future and we have a project wisdom that we'll be launching uh, later this year where people will be able to buy our earbuds if they want to contribute to science and while they're watching Netflix. Um, we believe that's a great thing, right? Um, and so, you know, they will be able to, to do that, but, you know, we're looking at models to keep that data local and we just abstract. And so we can do the learning, you know, from across a large population so that we can take the healthy control data and then have that help us develop our pathological um, uh, algorithms to help with epilepsy and, you know, extreme sleep disorders. So, so there are some, you know, uh, breakthrough algorithms that are out there that encourage that privacy, which is really good. And, um, and then again, the second point being that, you know, it, it is a signal that just by itself, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be that, um, that damaging, but in context, uh, there could be some, some problems. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So um, the question here from Kavita and also Andrew, let me know if anyone's hands up that I haven't seen. I don't see any, but I just want to make sure. Um, how unique is in-ear EEG and what does the research landscape look like for that? Sure. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that um, Daniela Mondich um, and uh, Kid Mose 
uh, Preben Kipnose were probably the first two. So if you look at some of their publications, they'll go back about 10 years. Um, they didn't have any sophisticated ear scanning technologies that later got developed. And so you'll see a lot of crude um, prototypes, but you know they were some of the first to show that there was real brain signal there. And so they looked at it with uh, sleep patterns. There's a really nice uh, publication of about 70 subjects, I think that Kipnose did uh, showing sleep uh, can be recorded in ear. And um, I, I think that, you know, essentially that was some of the research. You know, I would say I, I owe, um, you know, my own confidence from their research, meeting them in person, and then Alan, uh, who I met about five years ago. And, and we talked about if we built something like this, what would be the clinical use cases? And I've always been more drawn towards, you know, the clinical and the medical as opposed to you know, more the human computer interface. Um, so there's there's a, a great amount of literature that's out there. And I would say every month there's new publications. And so that to me is very exciting. Again, I, you know, uh, want to represent sort of the whole field on this call, not, you know, not next sense. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting companies. There's going to be a lot of interesting products. I just hope that they're thoughtfully, you know, designed and, and you know, we're, we're keeping in mind uh, data privacy. Alan, anything you wanted to add to that? Um, you know, I spend my time trying to think about how we can cure Alzheimer's disease and all the patients, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, one of the reasons I've loved working with JB because it, there's a lot of conscience there, you know, mm -hmm. so they are trying to do the right thing and that, that yeah. through loudly. I think it would yeah. be interesting to talk a little bit more about, um, you raised the point, Diane, about the ability to modulate. You know, mm -hmm. JB had suggested that maybe we talk a little bit about the potential to use this as a neuromodulation device. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're really excited about, um, there's been a terrific team at MIT that discovered that these high frequency gamma rhythms in the brain, um, that you can modulate them. Um, and you can modulate them with light flickering mm -hmm. at 40 times per second or sounds flickering at 40 times per second, right? And so what we realized early on is that since we can record uh, the frequency of the rhythm, we could use that as a way to detect whether brains are getting entrained. Uh, but the most important, most interesting thing is not just the sleep modulation, but if you change, if you introduce this 40 hertz modulation, you activate mm -hmm. the brain's neuroimmune system and you can actually clear out, wow. you, you can clear out amyloid pathology in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. This is rapidly getting translated into clinical trials in humans because it's so safe wow. and invasive. So, you know, the thought that you could you know, deliver this non-invasively through an earbud, perhaps even sub-threshold, you know, yeah. um, delivery is pretty incredible. Yeah, that is, that's absolutely fascinating. And on your first slide um, where you were showing sort of an explanation, uh, explicating the EEG, going back to the original um, observations and you had all the different waveforms um, shown there in, the, in, in your first slide, um, one of the things that was going through my mind is I, in my course, I always get students who ask me about, they listen to things that are meant to um, change their uh, uh, brain waves, right? So they go on YouTube and they listen. They ask me how, you know, how legit are these things? Um, and so so what you're telling me now is absolutely fascinating. Um, and and the, the I did not know that about the immune system. I mean, that that is just an amazing possibility if it could happen. Um, um, I'm trying to remember the, the terminology for these video, these audio that you can listen to on YouTube that's meant to try to. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say what it is? <laughs> well, I think, I think, yeah, sometimes the popular term is binaural beats. Binaural beats. Gosh, I don't know why. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. That I was having like a senior moment. I couldn't remember binaural beads. And so they believe that if they listen to these, they can get their brain entrained into these different into these different modes. And of course they don't know because they're just they got a headset on and they're just listening. But for example, some people with post-traumatic stress disorder um, can listen to these and it actually alleviates some of their anxiety or depression even. And so and so in the military context, people ask me frequently how how relevant are these potential technologies or are they do they really work? Um, they seem to work, but you know we don't have good clinical evidence, um, too too much clinical evidence in that space. But anyway, um, you're right. Having it via an earbud that's that's directly controlled is is fascinating. Okay, so we've got just um, three minutes left. I want to um, check with Andrew and Kavita and make sure did we get everybody's questions? 
Did I miss anyone who wanted to ask a question and didn't get the opportunity? I don't see any, but I'm also looking now for hands if there is an additional question or two. Okay, and of course, Todd, my 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 chair, Todd, any um, remarks from you before I pass over question. the question? Yeah. I uh, I so being in the ear, you're kind of close to the vagus sort of area. Could there be some interesting ways to explore the vagus nerve as well in terms of modulation? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, well. Wow. Todd, you, you know this very well. I think one of the things that um, we're interested in, and other people too, are the auricular stimulation. And it's, so I think that because the peripheral nerves of the vagus nerve are in the ear, it's very interesting to think about how you could, you could modulate that. And so um, I, I think modulation is something that, you know, next sense has been a little bit, um, I guess, cautious, you know, to go into. And because again, there's only so much you can do as a small company. Um, but as as we grow, I'm certainly uh, keeping a keen eye on that research because if you could, um, you know, modulate the the vagus nerve, Todd, as you know, you've you've done you know a lot of research in this area. You might be able to help with digestion. You might imagine sort of um, I think of sort of almost digital interventions in the moment. So you know, some people uh, take a beta blocker before a presentation like this. Um, and what if you just had the digital stimulation of, of the VNS uh, to 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 calm the nervous system or, or things like that? So I think there's a lot of very interesting research with neuromodulation. modulation. I do think we have to be careful. And so I think Diane, you mentioned people going on Amazon, hooking up nine volt batteries, you know, really hope that people aren't aren't doing that um, because, you know, we it, it's unlikely that if you just um, you know, excite a bunch of neurons in the, the frontal lobe that, uh, who knows, maybe you're just agitating it and the brain sort of kicks into gear to repair things that were, were done and it feels like you get this temporary boost in focus. Um, so I think all modulation needs to be very uh, thoughtfully done and, and I'll look to the academics like I did for uh, EREG to see some well-published results, peer-reviewed journals uh, before NextSense goes too, uh, too far in that space. JB, it's a treatment for, all, for epilepsy already. Time to move. <laughs> Not in the ear, though, right? Uh, vagal nerve stimulation, though. Yeah, yeah direct vagal nerve stimulation, correct. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, very cool. Well, um, I think um, I'm going to turn it back to Andrew, but I just want to say thank you so much for this uh, session. I'm, I'm just fascinated by this. Um, I'm going to have a lot of remedial reading to do after this uh, revelation of some of these studies. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. And thank you so much for sharing it all with us. Um, Andrew, Kavita, I will turn back over and uh, let you tell us what's going to happen next. Yes, and, and I'll echo the thanks, Diane, uh, not just to Alan and JV, but you and, and Todd and the rest of our standing committee as well. There is a, a closing slide that I have today just as a reminder for everyone tuning in that, um, as I said at the, the front end, a proceedings and brief document will be published here in the next uh, handful of months that kind of outline and chronicle the discussions that took place, not just today, but in the sessions that took place last week as well. Um, you are uh, welcome to follow along with the standing committee. Our website is listed there. And if you're interested in kind of being pinged, uh, not just when the, those proceedings come out, but other activities uh, that come up within the Board on Life Sciences, feel free to visit our website that's listed there and you can sign up for our listserv where the notifications for that will come out. With that, um, thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you, JB and Alan, again, for joining us. Uh, very much looking forward to continued discussions and conversations uh, around this and, and plenty of other topics. Um, I'll mention for our standing committee members, we'll be migrating over to our, our Zoom call that's within your calendar invitation. Um, but with that, I will close out today. And, and thank you so much all again for, uh, for the, the great conversation.